evening to everyone. Welcome to the Foss Waterway Seaport. Tonight, we are diving into history. I am going to be your host, your guide this evening. My name is Chris. I'm with Pretty Gritty Tours. Obviously, you should know that by now. And tonight, we are actually down here for our first hybrid in-person virtual event right down here at the Foss Waterway Seaport. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna walk you guys around a little bit, showcase what's going on tonight, and then we are gonna to get to hear from some very important people in the industry, including Ryan Spence, uh, a local diver, and I'm going to say the most knowledgeable individual on Cousteau history in the area. Then we are also going to get to hear from Robert Mester, who is a, a longtime favorite here at Pretty Gritty Tours. So we'll, we'll look at the treasure, we'll look at what's going on, if you guys have questions, comments, please let me know. Uh, this is gonna be the first time that I'm not like at the hub the whole time, but uh, I have my lovely assistant, Tani, who will be monitoring the questions throughout the evening. So if you have them, uh, they can go up on screen. I can address them in real time, or as Ryan is doing his presentation, he'll be able to answer them as well. But we have a unique opportunity right now that we don't normally have where I get to actually walk you around right now live in the seaport building. And I feel like I talk about it all the time, but this is truly one of the most magical places here in Tacoma and you get to see it right now. So for those of you who haven't uh, tuned into any of these before, the Foss Waterway Seaport building is the former Balfour Dock building. This is the last remaining section of what was once the longest grain storage warehouse west of the Mississippi, just over a mile long of these warehouses. And they've got, you can see up here, the trestles, right? So all of these are constructed by railroad workers who are making trestle bridges across America as they were connecting the East and West Coast for the first time in American history. And when they got here, they created this warehouse for the railroad and they put these exquisite trestles up there at the top. And it's amazing that this is still here in the immaculate condition that it is today. Uh, as we go around here, you get to see also the, the true highlight of the Foss Waterway Seaport building, which are these handcrafted boats. And I wanna introduce you to one of my absolute favorites right over here. Uh, the namesake of the Foss Seaport is, of course, Taya Foss, Norwegian immigrant who came to the area, started her whole business out here, and became swiftly the largest and most successful maritime industry, again, west of the Mississippi. And what I love about the story is that Taya was such a successful businesswoman that her husband, Andrew, who was a carpenter at the time, ends up committing his whole life to creating things like this. This is an Andrew Foss original. You can see it's actually got the original salmon, the house sigil of House Foss, still on there. And Andrew was originally a shipwright who ends up going on to create rowboats, tugboats, uh, and other seagoing vessels, not just for the Foss family, but for mariners throughout the area. And he's actually responsible for pioneering a lot of the maritime technology that makes seagoing vessels more safe for mariners throughout the history here in the United States. And that's kind of kind of the through line. You get to see over here, the, the real theme of the Foss Seaport are these small vessels from the Pocock racing shells that we have hanging from the, the trestles up here to the variety of rowboats out here. And each of these is handcrafted by someone notable in Tacoma's history. And you get to walk amongst these and really be a part of the history here. And getting to do that is a tremendous experience. So let me take you guys now through the seaport really quickly so that you can see a little bit about what's going on tonight. So one of the big events is of course, diving into history. So they have a virtual VR diving experience that you can do here. And of course, the bar. So right behind me here, uh, they're serving up drinks out here in the seaport tonight, including the famous and historic Heidelberg beer, which uh, is in draft cans right now out of seven seas. They're pouring those right now. And as I'm walking through here, you get to see a lot of what makes the seaport phenomenal. 
not just the fact that it showcases the history of these small craft, but it is also an educational facility at its heart. So you can see an articulated whale skeleton up here. This is from a, a whale that washed up on shore out in Puget Sound and then was buried to allow decomposition for a period of time, brought here to this building when it was just sort of an empty warehouse, and then re-articulated by stadium high school students who came from the local high school just up the hill. And today, this young whale uh, is a really good example of the educational prowess of the area and of marine biology in Puget Sound. She's an example of the only whale that we know of who has died in Puget Sound and washed up on shore. Uh, so pretty remarkable. And dwarfing her is the skull from this fin whale right here, which you can see is just monstrous. Now down here is one of my absolute favorites I wanna show you guys here really quick. This is a Willets canoe. And I think several of you have been around for our presentation on the Willits brothers off of Day Island here in Tacoma. And, and just being close to the craftsmanship of one of these is extraordinary because you can see all of the copper nails in that red cedar that they all set by hand, creating really truly one of the most beautiful uh, seagoing canoes I've ever seen. Come down here and we'll get to briefly introduce you to, of course, uh, the Puyallup area here. So they have a whole exhibit on the history of the Puyallup Nation here in the area, their contributions to the history of their indigenous land. And this is always a good time to acknowledge the fact that we are on traditional Puyallup lands today. Now directly behind me, I'm gonna take you guys into the dive experience right now, because that's really a big, I think, focus of tonight, diving. We're gonna to talk tonight, or Ryan Spence is in particular, about Jacques Cousteau and his history here in the Tacoma area and the new Cousteau documentary that is coming out. And there is a remarkable amount of Cousteau equipment here in the seaport. So for my Cousteau fans out there, you actually get to see the actual equipment that Cousteau was using when he was diving in this area, as well as the prototype here of a new ship that he was testing out right there underneath the Narrows Bridge. You get to see all of that Cousteau equipment right here. Really extraordinary stuff. Uh, and I'm excited in just a couple of minutes to turn it over to Mr. Spence because he's going to be talking about uh, his experiences here uh, as well as a great deal of Cousteau. And when you come down to the seaport, which I hope you will, you too will get to see this tremendous collection of dive equipment that's been collected over the years, showcasing literally hundreds of years of diving technology, including the old hard hats, which... Uh, just for your fun trivia, one of the big dangers of those hard hats when you were diving down there, if you're doing undersea welding, uh, is that they're super conductive because of the copper. So you could actually uh, get stuck to things that you were welding and have to pry yourself loose. And then, of course, early diving history, back when they used to just put people inside one of these bells. Of course, this section here would have been enclosed. It would have been watertight. But then you would go underwater. Let's see if I can get the horrifying illustration yeah if you want to go ahead and get yourself a case of the bends for the weekend there's absolutely no quicker way to do it so now i'm going to walk you guys back through the seaport again if you have questions comments please let us know tonight and in just a couple minutes we're going to be turning it over to ryan who's going to be giving his presentation uh, i will be there answering questions throughout that time and then at the conclusion of his talk we are going to be kicking it over to mr robert Mester, who I think you can see just right over here. Da, 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 da. That dashing gentleman in the black leather jacket. He has actually brought with him tonight several artifacts that he has dug out of the sea and has, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, a whole volume of stories from his seafaring adventures around the world. So if you guys want to ask any questions of Mr. Robert Messer, now is your opportunity to do so. Please don't be shy. We are down here tonight 
at the Foss Waterway Seaport for their in-person live event. It's tonight from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. So if you missed out, keep keep your eyes on social media because I believe that they're going to be doing more of these in the future. So I'm going to I'm going to come on over here, dock this in the hub, and we're about to turn it over to uh, to Ryan. Actually, hold on. <laughs> I'm going to go check with my associates over here. We'll see how it goes. I'll check it out. We're good, good so far. Though. All right. So, uh, and it is, Stephanie, it's absolutely an extraordinary event tonight. I'm glad that we're down here. And honestly, it's just nice to be doing something in person again. So, uh, hold on a second. We, we good to go for Ryan? I think so, yeah. All right, everyone, uh, Julia Bird. <laughs> You may know her from a lot of the stuff that we're doing out here. You're impromptu on camera. Thank you. <laughs> we're all good whenever you guys are. Okay. I don't know where he is. Uh, I don't know. We've lost our star for tonight. So, uh, I'm going to come back over here to the main hub tonight. I'm going to check on your guys' questions and see if I can answer them as they are coming in. Oh. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it's no big deal. Uh, all right. Let's see here. I'm going to... Park it in the main tripod, and let's see what else you guys have. Questions about the Seaport building, please let me know. Questions about tonight, anything like that. And yes, it is a tremendous amount of space. I'm actually not even clear on how big the square footage is. Um, but here, while I've, while I've got you guys here, I can actually do my dream of taking you through the space right now. And I can take you over to the historic photograph area where you can see some of the things that always blow my mind. So not only does it have all the original trestles up here that support the roof, but they also kept one section. You can see down here, uh, when they were renovating the museum, they had to put in some reinforced concrete flooring, but they kept an example of the trestle supports that used to be underneath here. So this used to be the base of the seaport uh, warehouse there. And then I'll take you guys over here really quick where you can see what it looked like in the early days as a grain warehouse here. So you get to see all of the tall ships that used to come right up here. And it was designed so that uh, just outside this window here is the railway. Like you can bring a train literally right up to the doors here uh you can see right here so this is the seaport building in its early days you can bring a train right up to the edge of it offload all of these grain sacks here store them in the facility and then put them on a tall ship and send them right out to sea it was absolutely the most convenient an easy way to do transportation for the green stuff that showed up here in the area. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll get to actually take you guys into archives here a little bit later tonight. There are the weirdest, most haunted items kept in the back storage of this facility. Uh, some of them I'm deeply attached to, and I'd love to tell you the stories of a few of those. So we'll see how the evening goes. We'll see how the evening goes. Oh, and thank you. It's not a bad tie. Guys, you don't have to make this all about me. I'm excited to be at the seaport tonight. So we're going to go ahead and, and get you guys set up here because I think we're about to begin our talk. If you have questions along the way, please let me know. And I'll see you in just a second.
something like this. Set. everybody. My name is Ryan Spence. I'm on the board of directors here at the Seaport. I, on behalf of the Seaport, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many faces, some new faces, uh, friends of mine, new friends. Um, so welcome to the Seaport. How many people is this your first time? That's the stuff. Welcome. It's one of Tacoma's hidden treasures. It's not so hidden now, but we've got lots of good stuff, lots of activities. You can follow us on social media, um, get on email, whatever you like. We'll find you. We'll get you the information you need. So come back. You can never spend too much time. So I'm going to spend some time tonight uh, talking about my experiences with the Cousteau family and crew members, some of my adventures. I'm going to start out. How many people here know who Jacques Cousteau is? It's okay, you don't have to raise your hand if you're not super familiar. <laughs> so I'm going to open with a couple of uh, movie trailers here for some projects that I worked on. Uh, the first is a fictional, historically fictional account called The Odyssey, a French film uh, from a few years back. I'll talk about my involvement on that later. Uh, and then the second is actually in theaters now and should be streaming on Disney Plus, the National Geographic production called Becoming Cousteau. Uh, so we'll watch the trailer of that. It just wrapped up its uh, screenings at the Grand Cinema. I think it might still be showing in Lakewood. I'd like it to come in Disney Club shortly. So I'll open with the two trailers here, and then I'll talk more. Thank you. 
I love to share the world and see the people with love. I love to do it. I love to do it on you. I became an inventor of my native people. People at that time had no idea what was going on with the stuff.
with cocaine. And uh, this guy was like, I got free time. Uh, and so he ended up going to jail. And then when he got out, he was like, I got diving experience and nothing to do. So he got hired by Chris Hill. So you never know, again, like where, where life is going to take you. He does some great say no to drugs presentations all over the world now. Anyway, so it started with the red hat and it got bigger. I have lots and lots of things. And my wife reminds me of that all the time. Uh, and so this is all original. This is the timeline from the original TV series and the original concept art. And basically spanning the equipment, pretty much complete line of equipment spanning the entire uh, television career. And I have a huge collection of documents. Um, all kinds of stuff. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the best part about collecting Cousteau is people. Everybody thinks it's the equipment and all the cool stuff, but it's the stories, it's connecting with people, it's traveling the world, doors just open for me. Um, this is Jean-Michel Cousteau, this is Jacques' oldest son, uh, who lives down in Santa Barbara currently and is still actively involved in his own nonprofit. Ocean Futures does a lot of work, has produced a lot of film, uh, television, and he has had a pretty long career that's ongoing in the IMAX realm. This is one of my favorite human beings on Earth, uh, Andre Lebon. He worked with Trousseau for many years. He was involved with engineering and design, especially in the early years, which were highly technical, underwater habitat, deep diving submersibles, all this innovation. And he is a man, a true Renaissance man, kind of cliche these days, but he played the cello, you saw him briefly in the trailer of the film. Uh, Ward clips it a lot, he was a painter, he paints underwater with oil paints, which is fascinating uh, and beautiful. This is Andre with the tanks from the Academy of Academy. Academy Award winning film The Final World, which are on display here at the Park. Here's one of the paintings. This is at Andre's 85th birthday in France. This is actually the title piece to the exhibition that hangs in my seven year old bedroom. So Andre passed away a couple of years ago. But an amazing man, engineer, brilliant mind, satirist, photographer, musician, brilliant engineer, brilliant diver. So the original crew with Trousseau, Trousseau on the right, you have three people, Frederick Dumas, Luc Caillé, and Jacques. Everybody called Jacques Chic, which is just French for his initial GYC. Easier to say. Anyway, so Frederick Dumas, great spear fisherman. That's how they met. During World War II, people are hungry in Europe. You know who's not hungry? Spear fisherman. So they became quick friends. Louis Taillé had a brilliant military career. Rousseau was in the military, originally flew the airplane, um, but got pushed out of that after a car crash. Um, that's when he started swimming. So one of my favorite journeys took me here. It's Frederick Dumas' home in the south of France. Uh, great trivia. So this little addition here, uh, after the Silent World won the Academy Award, he went to Gique and said, I need a bigger house. And Jeek said, well, the film did pretty well. Here's a check. So he just wrote him a check, and then he built this. And he spent most of his later part of his life in this little tiny basement apartment down here, I'm like writing me through this. Yeah. My bedroom for the week. Uh, and this is where it's located. It's right in that kind of tree hillside. But most of those other houses weren't there very direct line. And so a lot of those early films, some of the things that you saw in the trailer was diving and spearfishing right here uh, in South France. This is another one of my favorite opportunities. This is the Oceanographic Institute in Monaco. The board of directors there sent me an email and they were like, we have this idea to do this thing. Want to come for a visit? Okay. So I said, sure. Uh, so it was great. I got to go there, meet with everybody, got to hold behind the scenes. Trousseau was the executive director of the Oceanographic Institute in Monaco for almost 50 years. He 
had some terrible ideas about some modern additions down here, which thankfully were never completed. But uh, not all ideas are good. Anyway, it's a beautiful facility, one of the oldest aquariums. It's one of the first places they ever grew coral in captivity. Another thing I love when you're on the roof, I'm like up on the roof and I'm looking down, and there's a skate park. That's a story for another time. <laughs> so here, this is uh, off of Marseille. Cusco did an archaeological expedition, one of the early ones, um, right here. And currently, it's in this giant triangle. No anchoring of boats, and no diving. Uh, it's a forbidden zone because there's a lot of antiquities still down there. They excavated almost 5,000 amphoras from what they thought was one shipwreck. It ended up being two shipwrecks, one Greek, one Roman. There's still artifacts down there. So we actually, again, they're like, you want to come to South of France? Yes. And uh, actually, the first time I went to South of France, they're like, can you be there in two weeks? And they're like, I've never been to Europe. But my wife made me get a passport. So, okay. So I could just get to Marseille. That's all I had. No itinerary, nothing. And like, and then just go to the hotel. Okay. Fly over there, catch a train, and go there. And I'm like, I'm Ryan? And they're like, oh yeah, here's your keys. And then I go to this big dive event, and they're like, I'm Ryan. And here's your credential. So anyways, we did this whole thing. So then we went and met up with people. They're like, you know, we got permits to dive in the forbidden zone. Well, that sounds good. Uh, and so, they're like, do you want to go? And I said, yes. That's the secret. If you want to do this stuff, if you want to have the largest, you just say yes to everything and you work the details out later. People are like, ah, no, I can't. Not in two weeks. Like, I, I spent my first Father's Day in the south of France, like on this trip, actually. But he was a baby. <laughs> It was nice, the family there made me a beautiful Father's Day card. This is my first Father's Day. So this is the archaeological site. You can kind of see the hold on, hold on, hold on. You can kind of see the topography of the rocks matches the, up there. So they parked Calypso there, and there's a long boom structure that they came out that had a suction hose that went down, and they used the suction hose to pull away all the sand and debris and pull up all the import. The tragic part is they didn't really know the effects of taking things in salt water and pulling them out. So most of them ended up breaking later, but they learned some tough lessons along the way. And this, uh, actually, this expedition is featured in the Academy Award in the film, Sound of World. So, anyway, do you want to go diving? I'm not sure. So, we go. This is actually me, and this is the suction pipe that's still down there. So, that's pretty exciting. And we actually went down there, and there's pieces of amphora still there, and we saw an octopus. And, and then we went back to the beach and had lunch with like all the Cousteau guys, about 15 different people, on the beach and uh, ate great food, drank some wine. Unfortunately, I can't really drink a lot of wine, but they always offer it to me. <laughs> I had a pretty famous French household, and I couldn't drink the wine. And so we gave a toast, and I'm like, do when I have one, so I raise my water glass and he goes, I do not raise my glass to water. <laughs> and also, the bread goes on the table, not on the plate. <laughs> I'm just remembering, I don't know that much. <laughs> so, this is another trick in South of France. This is actually the door on the Cousteau family residence. Well, this is pretty good. So, I'm staying down the street at the Dumas family home, right? There's only three of these people from the 40s, right? So down the street is the Cousteau family. It's still in the Cousteau family. So I'm walking by with my friend Franck, who's kind of my French historical counterpart. He had a huge role uh, in the film. I'll talk about that in a minute. Anyways, we're walking by, and I hear somebody in there. And I'm like, Franck, we should go knock on the door. Okay. So I knock on the door. And it's got Chapkin, who's married to Jean Michel's daughter. But Grand, the husband of the granddaughter, he comes to the door and he goes, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm staying at the Dumas house. He's like, get out of here. We just got back from the Amazon. 
like, we're just getting settled in. They have a two-year-old at the time. They're like, I'll call you tonight. You gotta come over. Okay. And I didn't expect them to call. So we're hanging out with you at home, eating dinner, getting later, and the phone rings. Come over. And nobody ever gets invited to this house because it's a very private sanctuary. It was primarily the residence of Simone Cousteau. Good for the movie. She's actually one of the most interesting characters. It's Cousteau's wife. And she was the true captain of Cousteau. So this is kind of her private, uh, her private residence that stayed on that side of the family. Uh, and so it, you would never take a photo in here. You would never, no. But you just go and experience it. Yeah, it's amazing. Anyway, so the cool thing was, I'm at the Dumas house in there, and I'm with Juliette Dumas, who's uh, Frederick Dumas' daughter. And so I asked him, can I bring Juliet? She hasn't been to the house since like 1963 or something. And they're like, of course. And so through the strange twist of fate, I actually was the one that reintroduced the Dumas family to the Cousteau family. You, admit, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> So I like to play dress up. So this is actually me diving in all original Cousteau equipment. I started out restoring truck diving equipment uh, because I wanted to dive with it. I wanted to go and see for myself, to use the words of Cousteau. Uh, and so I started restoring it, and then that would come into play later, those skills. This little turtle. This is a freshwater spring in Florida. Some of the most clear water on Earth. Some people get a fear of height. The water's so clear when you're swimming on the surface and you're looking down to 80 feet, they don't register that the water's there. So they actually trigger some fear of height. All right, so this is the first trailer I showed. The Odyssey. Uh, and this was a great thing. They originally reached out to me because they had this grand idea. They were going to recreate all of these authentic scenes and they wanted me to make equipment and replicas and be perfectly historically accurate. Until they pitched the idea to Cousteau's second wife, Francine, who happens to own all the rights to Cousteau's stuff. And she wasn't really into this idea. So then they ended up hiring me to build stuff that was just enough to not like Cousteau. So I ended up using my, my skills and my knowledge of the equipment at the time to build stuff that was just enough off brand. To pass muster. But then the cool part was I it's all my original work. So I ended up actually building a huge amount of the dive gear that's used. So these backpacks I did, uh, I did some tank systems, I rebuilt uh, antique regulators for them to actually use. That sounds simple, but there's insurance companies involved with it. And so when you go to the insurance company on a feature link film, you say, We found this guy from Tennessee. We want to rebuild these regulators from the 50s, and we want to use them underwater and make a movie. And they're just like, I don't, I don't know, I don't think so. But we did it, and so they're actually diving with regulators that I you know, rebuilt the backpacks that I designed and built in my basement. Here's a behind the scenes photo showing the backpack on the left, and then kind of hyper modern rebreather. They use rebreathers to film because they don't emit bubbles and noise, so you pick up the noise of the characters, not of the production. And those are real sharks. This is in the Bahamas. They actually, the cool thing about this too is so I packaged all this stuff up in Tacoma and I shipped it to South Africa, and then they shipped it to Croatia, and they shipped it back to the Bahamas, uh, and they eventually took some of it to Antarctica. So they actually filmed on location all these things. And I was like, can I go? And they said no. Were you using chum to crack it? That was down in the Bahamas. They do do some chumming, I think, for some of those scenes. And then the final, some of the scenes, they actually mix a bunch of real sharks with some TGI. But all the ones in those movies. Are, but, correct. So that brings us to the current film, National Geographic offering Becoming Cousteau, in theaters now, and to Disney Plus. So this actually started not through Cousteau, but through a connection I had uh, in rock climbing, in Tacoma Connection. So my friend Mikey, who is one of the world's best rock climbers, worked on this film called Free Solo that happened to win an Academy Award. And he sent me an email and he's like, the producers are working on a Cousteau film. And I was like, well, you got to tell them about me. He's like, don't worry, I already did. And so 
Um, I ended up sending them some information, and they're like, oh, it seems like you have some stuff. You want to send your researcher out. So it turns out, like, after they went and visited with the Cousteau family, they came here to Tacoma, and they spent an entire week in my archives and photos going through stuff uh, when they were starting on the early days of the project. And then down the line, they ended up using some of the different documents, like the original pitch for the Undersea World series. Uh, they did that, used that, that's on film. We shot that in my studio here in Tacoma, which is pretty exciting. And I also did some other historical consulting on the film where I did you know, content editing and you know, making sure stuff was accurate in terms of some of the diving technologies and the terminology. All those types of things, and that was really interesting. Uh, it, it ended up being a really great film. I hope you can see it. I think it's still 100% fresh on Rotten Tomato. It's pretty good. Uh, and yeah, we enjoyed it. And it's not just a diving film. I think that's one of the things that really, it really gets into a lot of the personalities and stuff. And from my experience, it was interesting watching the film because I spent a significant amount of time with some of the people featured in the film. And I think it's really true for the most part to my experience hearing some of those stories firsthand. Uh, so it's, it's beautiful. The other thing that they really did is it's not a typical documentary where they go through and somebody's talking, oh, I knew Cousteau at 63. Um, they actually went back to the original film archives. So my friend Franck, who I went to the Cousteau family home and the Dumas family home, he spent years in the Cousteau archives going through all the raw footage that was never published. They digitized a bunch of that. They're currently working to restore that stuff. And that, a lot of that will come out. So the images are amazing. Most of the footage that people have seen, if you've seen it, was on very low res television screens, you know, from the 60s. Uh, and then later converted to video in the 80s. But the film stock they used was very high quality with great cameras and lenses. And so it really registers on high resolution uh, screens and looks increasingly. Are still relevant. So the Cousteau story, and this is featured in the exhibit that we have here. So this is one of the only places here at the Seaport that you can see original Cousteau equipment. We've got his wetsuit, we've got all kinds of different equipment, the tanks from the side of the world, uh, but we also have a huge area. Most of the film, the photos and film clips are all from the Northwest Expedition. So when they came to Tacoma, when they came uh, to Seattle and film. And this is actually off of Titlow Beach, right here in Tacoma. And actually, tonight we have somebody that was here when they shot this photo of this film. Randy, you want to stand up? You can't talk, but you can. <laughs> and that's what made me think, you think that's crazy. You know, like, whoa, it's like there's somebody here. That's, we're here in Tacoma. And there's some, but everywhere I go, I did a screening at the Grand, and there were only three people there. And one of the people was like, I met this stuff. And they had a whole story. Un unimaginable. Everywhere I go in the world for 20 years, there's always something. Uh, and that's the best part, hearing their stories, their experience, um, and their adventures. This is their second ship to Alcyon, to come in Narrows Bridge. It's from that same time period in the 80s. And then this is John's personal wetsuit. Hopefully you got to see it. Maybe you didn't realize what, I put this slide in here, so maybe you didn't realize what it is. But this is actual wetsuit from 1975. These photos that are here are of this. We have a lot of these. But this particular one. And these are the actual things from the final world. Uh, and that's an old picture from the film. So maybe if you get a chance after this, uh, you still have some time left. Talking about. Uh, go check that out or come back. All right. That brings me to the end. Not too bad. It's supposed to be about 30 minutes. Can I, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I'll start right here. I'll say first. Could you uh, tell a little bit about how the Calypso is related to the huge spell? Great. The question is can you tell how Calypso, Cousteau's ship, Related to Puget Sound. Most interestingly, it was built in Ballard. It was built as a minesweeper. The shipyard is still there. You can go, they have a tiny little Calypso model hanging on the wall, and you can see where it actually uh, hit the waters there and the ones with the locks. Um, 
And so yeah, it's uh, all Oregon wood. Built up there. They, the, it was a minesweeper, so they did a double wooden hull, so it had a low magnetic signature, because the mines were triggered by metal, ferrous metal, for the most part. So that's why it was wood, but that made a very good ocean-going vessel, because it would flex. That was, it was the exact opposite thing. They had this wooden boat, which was really comfortable to ride in, relatively. And then they built this new modern wind ship, and they built this super hyper rigid aluminum frame, and they coated it in fiberglass. And it would just pound the heck out of you. So, ah, which boat am I on for this expedition? Ah, new one. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. And they are working to restore Calypso. Uh, it actually has had it sunk in 1996. And Singapore is raised, it brought back. Uh, there were some battles over ownership for a number of years. Uh, Francine Cousteau and the Cousteau Society are working to restore it. They actually got very, very far along, had the Whole completely rebuilt, and then there was a fire at the facility in Turkey, uh, and so they're working to recover and rebuild yet again. But uh, by all accounts, it will eventually sail again. Other questions? Yes. Uh, nice. How did I get to Tacoma? Did that have anything to do with Gusto? I did not come here for Crusoe, and I actually came here in 1995 to go to the University of Puget Sound. I didn't really know about those connections at that time. And the other funny thing is, I had actually moved away from Tacoma, and I was living in Colorado, again, nowhere near the ocean, when I found the Red Hat sweater. And so I started going down that rabbit hole. I think part of the reason I was so enthralled is there's no water. Uh, at least I could look at pictures of water. And I eventually came to my senses and came back. After a little stretch. Are you still married? I am still married. <laughs> you know, okay, so what she's really asking is how do you have all this shit? And I don't know if I can say that on the live stream. Uh, and still be married. There's really another way to say it. That's how my wife is. Anyways, so my wife Corinne, yeah. The secret to our marriage, and she'll be quick to tell you, is off-site storage. <laughs> yes, I've been with my wife for almost 22 years. Yeah, good question. Ask about the props that I built for the movie. Do we have any failures or kind of missteps? And part of it is the the parts that I built were housings around. You still have to use like rated pressure cylinders. They're highly regulated all over the world by Department of Transportation, government, and everything. So you have to start with stock parts in terms of like the pressure vessels and stuff. And so a lot of the components that I built were. Uh, and the aesthetic housings around, suspension systems, tank straps, metalwork, that kind of stuff. We did actually, years ago we started, because you couldn't get the parts to restore the, uh, the old regulators, there's a whole community about that started fabricating those again, working with suppliers. So we actually spent a lot of R&D to get those processes right, so that they could be distributed. Uh, back with the beard and back, I'll come back to you in a minute. <laughs> yes, the primary mission was octopus at the time. Uh, and they did two expeditions here, one in the 70s, and then again in the 80s, octopus were heavily featured. There were two things going on with the 80s, the one that I showed. One was a sea trial for the new wind ship, I'll see on that one. Those two masts that come up were actually the frigid sails that were coming here. It was part of the sea trials they were coming through, but they still uh, octopus, they did some salmon stuff. A lot of that was actually from Alaska because they had the north. Um, but yes, they came for octopus. It's really interesting that, particularly in the 70s, the divers uh, from the Mediterranean and Europe were used to very small octopus, very large octopus. So they're actually quite nervous to handle. And not all the divers were comfortable interacting with octopus here. They actually ended up working with 
uh, a woman here named Joanne Duffy, and she was featured in the film and uh, was one of the handlers of the octopus. And everybody was just so impressed that this woman was dealing with these monsters at the deep. Very silly. It's a bunch of boys on a boat, so you can imagine. Oh yeah, the tide. So yeah, there were. Uh, you do have to. There's no way to dive the arrows without feeling the tide. Kid low, like right there, close to shore, you get a little bit of a window. But they were experienced diving tides. They also went up the dome, off the wreck of the diamond off of Port Townsend, which is a really famous shipwreck. Um, I'm getting the rapid up. A few more questions. Okay, front there. Trial and error, talking to older generations of people that have worked with the equipment firsthand, talking to the manufacturers, a lot of tinkering. You know, there's still the red scale, the black map. Oh, it's hard. The next place, the place I haven't been. I, you know, I like diving just because I love the novelty of diving right here at the Coma because we were in my backyard. Growing up in Memphis, the idea that there'd be cool things to see in my own backyard is fantastic. Um, I really like diving in San Juan. One more quick one. Yes. He was. He dove up into. He had respiratory issues towards the very end, but yes, he dove actively. All the way up to the end. And actually, it's really, I've been working on an article for a bunch of years. Someone tells this thing, but there's a really interesting lineage of regulators that he developed for himself to kind of compensate for his respiratory issues in older age. Eventually, when I get him in, it'll be pretty interesting. Get four people to read it. Well, I really appreciate everybody coming out. I hope you had a good time. I got to give a a big shout out to the Seven Seas Brewery in Heidelberg. They donated the beer this evening, and they're big fans of the Seaport and my work, and have been supportive in many ways. So go visit them. It's a tough time for all restaurants and purveyors to buy some of their beer. Come back and see us at the Seaport. Pay attention to all the stuff we have going. There's always stuff going on. And I'm going to hand it back. Thank you. thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that if you did complete the bingo and turn it in, you can get a free membership. So if you didn't put your name and email, you can go ahead and go back to the front and make sure that you put that on there. So if you complete, if you got a bingo, then you're eligible to win a free membership. So thank you all so much for coming. There's just a few minutes left, and we hope to see you at our next event next year. Thank you. Well. There we have it, my friends. Another exciting dive into history out here in Puget Sound. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Robert Mester, master diver, treasure hunter, marine salvage extraordinaire, has been called away on a dive uh, just south of here. So he's not available for us to talk tonight. But I guarantee if you send us your questions for Robert via email or put them in the comments below, I will relay them to him and make sure that he at least sees them. I can't guarantee that he'll answer them, but I'll do my best. But thank you for coming out tonight and experiencing another piece of the local history here. I say it so many times that I feel like someone's gonna put it in my autobiography, which will be me, that we are so tremendously lucky to have the Foss Waterway Seaport building down here and that it has become a really a sacred vault for Tacoma history not just maritime history, but the entire story of Tacoma ends up getting told down here. And the fact that we are a sea town just means that a lot of that relies heavily on our, our maritime past. And the fact that you have it here at your fingertips to come down and experience, including the 253 Heart, recently moved out of Hilltop down here into the Seaport building. There's a lot so much more than I could possibly recommend in a single hour. So I'll keep doing it every third Thursday for as long as they let me. Thank you guys for coming out tonight and experiencing this. I'm looking forward to next month's virtual experience. We are going to be talking uh, with an Italian photographer who has 
dedicated his life to photographing shipwrecks. So we have really incredible stuff coming up. You guys let me know what you are interested in seeing. We'll do our best to cover it. But until next time, I'm your guide and your host, Chris, down here at the Fosswater Seaport in downtown Tacoma, reminding you, keep on exploring. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you soon.